This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. My mom hung it on the fridge when I got a good report card. Why can't my employer be just as excited? You reach out to 100 people or 100 employers and only 10% get back to you. You feel awful. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we learn why it can be so hard for recent grads to find a job and what you can do to launch your career. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 174. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Hey there, Dan. Josh, good evening to you. Hope things are well. Things are well, Dan. I'm excited about this episode, and I'm excited about the beer segment this week. It's another IPA. Happy to see it. Back to our roots, IPAs. And Dan, this is a good one, I think. You are going to like it. All right, so we have this week on the show the Heretic Brewing Easy Juice, and that is easy spelled letter E, letter Z, Z, as it should be. And all right, Dan, so this one on the can, it says a New England style India Pale Ale IPA. And so listeners of the last episode will remember that we are taking a small tour of the variety of IPAs that are out there. And Dan, last episode, you will recall that we had a West Coast IPA. And do you remember what the West Coast IPA was all about? Yes, it was the West Coast of Ohio, as I made fun of for (laughs) most of that segment. That's true, you did. Uh, But beyond that, anytime you see West Coast IPA, what that means is lots of hops boiled in with the, the beer as it's being brewed leading to a really bitter beer. And Dan, do you remember, this is actually around the time we started the podcast, in the middle, the mid-2010s, that there was this trend in craft brewing at that time where it seemed like brewers were competing with one another to see who could dump the most hops in, who could crank that IBU, which is the a measurement of bitterness, who could crank that up the highest. Do you remember? And all the names, even of the beers of that time, at least the IPAs, tended to be about Showing how bitter the yeah, flavor was, of the beer was. It was Hop Devil and Hop Executioner and a 30 <laughs> and a 60 and a 90 minute and a dry hop and a wet hop. Yes, I remember it. Yeah, but one of the things happened, maybe I don't, I don't want to say a response to that, uh, but maybe so, was the introduction of a different type of IPA called the New England style IPA. And this has a few other names you might see uh, in the market as the Hazy IPA or the Juicy IPA. You see this everywhere now. But at the time, uh, some even referred to this New England style IPA as the anti-IPA. And the reason is, um, this is an India Pale Ale, an IPA like the West Coast, but this New England style, instead of boiling all the hops in the brew kettle, um, bringing out all that bitter flavor, instead you throw all the hops in at the end called dry hopping. And what that does is instead of imparting a bitter flavor, instead you get more of the aromatic uh, citrusy notes that come from the hops. Um, And also a little bit of this hazy characteristic that uh, a New England style IPA IPA is known for. So Dan, what do you, what do you think of this one? The easy juice? Well, you're making me think of when we brewed beer, you could eat one of the little dried hop pellets. And I did. And it is one of the most intense experiences you will ever have because it does have all these citrusy, minty notes on the front and then it just (laughs) just blooms into bitterness and so i can imagine how adding these at different times cooking them at different temperatures is going to extract those different flavors um i do like this this is they they call this one sessionable which i think means a little bit lower alcohol content a little bit lower gravity and i don't know this is i don't know whether my palate has been destroyed by ipas and so i don't (laughs) taste the bitter soap but I feel like this one is more approachable to somebody that maybe wants to try a beer toward the IPA end, but isn't ready for that leap. Yeah, my wife is an example of of your point there, Dan. I I know. I mean, you and I drank IPAs pretty regularly back in those 
those hoppy West Coast 2010 days. And she definitely had in her head that an IPA was probably the last beer she would choose. Like eating a of bar that. of soap. Yeah, yeah. But now, fast forward seven years, and she tends to go for the IPAs, but more this New England style. She loves that fruity characteristic, and it almost, in my mind, it's almost a different type of beer in some ways. I would have never considered an IPA a sit-by-the-pool-during-the-summer-months <laughs> type of beer, uh, but these New England styles are. And, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this on the show is is dive into a couple of these common IPA types is just because of how different a West Coast versus a New England style can be. And so if you were like I was for a long time, you might know, well, I had this one IPA at the bar that was so delicious and I really liked it. And then you <laughs> you go a week later and try to order another one and you completely hate it. So as you try these and kind of learn what these words mean, you can or learn what these these types of IPAs mean, you might be able to zero in on the ones that are better fit for your tastes. Where is Heretic Brewing, Josh? Oh, I didn't mention that. It better uh, be in New England. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, Dan, and I would be remiss to to not say that this New England style IPA comes to us from Fairfield, California. Uh, perfect, Josh. <laughs> the actual West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Mind blown emoji. <laughs> all right, Dan, let's thank some people. We'd like to thank Promega. You can find Proteomics content on Promega Student Resource Center. Discover proteomics methods and techniques. You can express and detect proteins, examine protein interactions, and more. Just go to promega.com slash helloproteins. All right, Dan, let's jump into our topic of the week. All right, Dan, we talk a lot on this show about graduate school. Really? That's what this is about? <laughs> I thought it was a beer show. <laughs> but one thing I know about graduate students is eventually they want to find a job after graduate school. And we want that for them, Josh. That is what we desperately desire for these people is to be able to find jobs. You could argue that should be or that should be a major factor or consideration in choosing to do a graduate degree in the first place is how can I leverage this or use this as a launching point or stepping stone to get into a career that I want to do. And yeah. we're going to learn a little bit about that today. Yeah, I think 30, 50, whatever, 100 years ago in the sciences, when you just went on to be a, a PI, you, you went on to be like your boss, there was this training program. You could see the steps that it took to do a postdoc, to have a faculty position. And you stayed kind of in that insular world of academia. You stayed in the ivory tower. Now, a lot of people go into industry or they go into nonprofits or to, to government work. And making that transition to a job, finding a job, is a different playing field. It's like you got trained in baseball and now you've got to go play basketball. And uh, I think that can be a shock for a lot of people. And so they struggle. New grads often struggle. And so today we're going to talk to Andrew Webb, who runs a website called employedhistorian.com. And he went through this and now writes about it. So take a listen to this. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm Andrew Webb. Uh, I graduated with a master's degree in history and then sort of took this winding path into publishing and then digital marketing. And I'm actually now working in the tech sector with uh, a lovely Canadian company called Shopify. That's what I do by day. But by night, I actually run the Employed Historian blog where I show recent graduates and humanities and liberal arts grads, how to find jobs and how to build careers. So that's me in a nutshell. Well, welcome, Andrew. And I'm very excited to talk to you today. Job searching, job finding is one of my passions. And <laughs> I just remember how hard it was as a recent graduate with an advanced degree, being told you're overqualified and you're underqualified and just being turned down time and time again. And and this is part of your story too, isn't it? T tell us a little bit about yeah. your time right after graduating and how you went about a job search. Yeah, for sure. So I, I was actually very fortunate in right away, I actually had a friend who said, hey, uh, I found this this job post on Kijiji and I'm going to go follow it up. And I thought, well, Kijiji, like, are you serious? Like you're, you're going to get murdered in an alley. So what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but I, I tried it out. I followed it up. 
It was actually a legitimate advertisement. And I actually ended up working there for about a year, but it was so toxic that everyone left. And I realized I had been riding the coattails, I guess just the reputation of my then boss. So when when we parted ways, I realized I didn't know how to articulate my skills. I really had trouble figuring out what was transferable, what was not. And I had a lot of misconceptions about the face value of an advanced degree. And I was emphasizing all the wrong things. And honestly, this, I think my unemployment stretch lasted for nine months around that. Like it was a really long time. It's a painful amount of time. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it was quite soul crushing to be honest. But you weren't unique in that, right? Uh, recent graduates, I'm quoting here from a blog post you posted called, yeah. I have a master's degree and can't find a job. But you say that recent grads actually have a harder time. They, they spend more time searching for jobs. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. The research that I've found, it, it indicates that the average job seeker, like an established professional, will probably spend about four months looking for a job. Sounds whereas right. a new graduate, on average, spends about seven, I think the exact figure was 7.4 months. So about seven and a half. Not quite double, but pretty close, right? So, I mean, you can imagine just having no network, having very little, maybe no experience. You know, it's not hard to imagine that it takes so much longer. And I did not know this at the time. I, I wish I could go back in time and tell myself that, but here we are. So it is just a function of being new on the job market that maybe somebody with a few years of experience who has already developed a network can come out of a job and move into another job pretty quickly, four months. But if you're a recent grad, you have your university training and that's it. <laughs> so how do you yeah. get your foot in the door? That's a real challenge. It is. And it is this conundrum that everyone knows, but no one really talks about it. Where it's just, it's this cart and horse or chicken and egg thing where you can't get a job because you don't have the experience, but you can't get experience because no one will give you a job. You talk in your article about some lessons that you learned the hard way. <laughs> and I was really intrigued by yeah. these because some of them are a little bit counterintuitive and yet I think they are commonly held. And so can you talk us through some of these lessons that you took from the job search, the way that you approached it in the wrong way? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, the first was that I thought that my degree and that my grades spoke for themselves. And, and I thought that, you know, even if no one really wanted to see the transcript, that, you know, if I had like honor roll on my resume, I thought that people would say, oh, well, this person is hardworking. They are dedicated. They will put in the hours. They know how to learn. And just I had all of these erroneous assumptions yeah. about what it meant. My mom hung it on the fridge when I got a good report card. Why can't my employer yeah. be just as excited? Exactly. And at the very least, you think, well, maybe I still have to prove myself, but this should at least help me earn the chance, you think. Yeah, you assume um, that they're going to make the mental leap between your GPA and all of these traits that you possess as a hard worker. But that's asking yeah. a lot of somebody who's scanning a resume for a few seconds. Yeah, it is. And I mean, there, there are stats out there, but I know that resume, or resumes, recruiters usually only spend about, I think it's like eight to 10 seconds scanning a resume. You know, the exact number will probably differ depending on who you ask, but it's not long. You know, it's a fraction of a minute. All of that work I put into those resumes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But one of the other things that I just did not catch on until later was that I really had to be, like, I really had to build my own experience. I guess I just thought that I would be able to prove myself once I got a foot in the door, but really people kind of expect, at least employers seem to expect that you will come with your own experience, that you will at least have tried something or done an internship or something to that effect or something in school, like some sort of side project or extracurricular in school. And that can be a little disarming coming from grad school because you're so busy, right? So in a master's degree in history, are you, I don't know a lot about it, so forgive my questions, but are you, you doing some independent research and writing a thesis? Is that how you get that degree? Or is it all classwork? How does that work? That's a good question. At my institution, there were three 
streams you could take. One was pure coursework. One was pure thesis work, probably about 150, maybe 200 pages. And in the middle, which is what most people did, was a combination of the two, where you would probably take about two semesters of coursework and then a third and or fourth dedicated toward a major research paper, probably about 100 pages. And that would be your independent research. And it was made very clear that if you wanted to continue on to a doctoral program, you could not do pure coursework. So but but even having those people. things, having those experiences in your academic training, a hiring manager is looking at that and saying, okay, Andrew took some classes and he wrote a long paper, but what's that got to do with me? How do I know yeah. that he's going to be able to do this job? And so I think you had to challenge some of your assumptions that, that they would inherently <laughs> find these things valuable and impressive. And yeah. you had to rethink that and, and translate it, basically translate it into the language that they would understand. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of research and, and not necessarily the kind of scientific research that involves careful experimentation and process, but it's more qualitative research. It's information gathering, it's information literacy, you know, trying to adopt the vocabulary of a bunch of different fields, bringing them together to create, you know, it could be a report, an interpretation or an analysis or whatever it might be. I did not know how to articulate any of that when I started. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, the skills, they are there. And, and that's just from the core work you would do in the degree. But, you know, there's also other things like in any kind of extracurricular work or, you know, a teaching assistant job that does carry a lot of experience with it as well. But you just you need to know how to articulate some of that or rather all of it in real measurable terms. Let's skip right into that. How do we talk about our experience in our training in a way that a hiring manager cares about. And so you talk about this really in the context of a resume and you have examples of kind of a before and after. Here's how I initially wrote the resume, assuming that they were going to read between the lines. And then here are some of the changes. Can you talk about the differences between those two? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, the big difference, the most important difference is that most people, including my former self, wrote task-based resumes. I did this. I handled that. And there's there's no real measurable impact or outcome. And it's really hard for hiring managers to say, how did this improve things or how did this keep the lights on? So for example, I would say I recruited some academics to contribute to an article or to, to a journal. Instead, I should have wrote, I recruited 13 niche academic contributors for a quarterly publication twice for a total of you know, 26. And, and from there, they can, I think they can extrapolate, okay, that probably took a lot of outreach work. If one in five say yes, like how many people did they have to reach out to? You know, they can kind of start drawing some conclusions about the effort that went into that. Yeah, the specificity really invites them to enter into your experience, right? So if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm reading a piece of fiction and it says, Joe went to the store uh, that's a sentence that falls on the page. But if you're describing the store yeah. and what Joe is wearing and what the air smelled like, and it's, that pulls me into this Joe's story. And, and I think by talking about, it, I recruited 13 niche academic contributors for a quarterly publication. It's like, okay, well, these people must've been hard to find. Now I know something about them just yeah. by adding those words. It wasn't two people. Getting two people to do something is, is one set of problems. <laughs> Getting 13 to do something is a different set. So I agree with you having mm -hmm. a little bit of detail in those. But I, I imagine this is a challenge for people because yeah. I feel like the temptation would be just to throw a number in but not to have it be meaningful. <laughs> I'm just so, I'm just picturing my first attempt at this would be like wrote a thesis that was 248 pages and used size 12 font. This has got some numbers in there. So, how do you how yeah. do you balance that? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I would say it usually the the best kind of number or quantified measurement to put in there is something that can be more like really closely affiliated with either the outcome of the project or the bottom line to the organization. If you're working in a university, probably you're not going to be able to say, well, you know, we sold copies of this. You're not in charge of sales. You're not going to be near that. Right. But you might be able to say, well, we increased our readership or, you know, we <clears throat> managed a grant of a certain size. 
Exactly. Yeah. Or 70% of the contributors were new or, you know, it could be anything. Yeah. And of course they, they just, at the end of the day, they have to have impact, you know, like even, even my teaching assistant role at first, I think I just said that I mentored some students, but really it was 40 students at a time or per semester. And the impact is, you know, maybe not immediate to the, the university's bottom line, but you know, you've, you've influenced some lives, you have probably uh, helped, I mean, you know, who knows how many people move on to the next stage of their education. So the value doesn't necessarily have to be to the organization for which you work, but it does have to be valuable. Those numbers have to be valuable to someone somewhere in the process. Right. And you're demonstrating some managerial experience. I love the the bullet point you have, which is improved class average from C plus to B plus in one semester. Because I can put myself in that space and know he wasn't just sitting at a desk in the front playing Wordle. He must have been working with these students and mentoring them and trying to manage them and and help them with their projects. And so even though that's not a number, it is a measure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's exactly like it's a kind of measurement that people will understand within the context of school. And again, from there, I I think hiring managers can get a sense of what you you probably did. And even maybe this is a stretch, but even getting a sense of some of the soft skills you might have, but that don't really translate to a resume, which is important for humanities grads. Uh, Very important, but hard to quantify. Yeah, and I think you wrote in your bio on this, this site that the things that your employer told you they valued about you after you were hired mm-hmm. were yeah. maybe different from what you thought you were writing in your first <laughs> resume. And and can you talk a little bit about what they said about your skills after you were on the job a little while that really opened your eyes to the value you do provide? Yeah, well, I mean, they told me that they loved my storytelling tell- ability, my ability to simplify concepts, to really get to the heart of the matter, sometimes a little bit too quickly even, but, <laughs> you know, it's a good skill to have nonetheless. And they, they liked my ability to, I guess, just to learn a bunch of different fields and kind of see the patterns between them. But wow, if you put that on a resume, you will fail. <laughs> yeah, I was going <laughs> like to say, they did they know they it. wanted that? Those, those seem like valuable things, but I can't imagine a hiring manager would ever list them as job requirements. No, they don't. I mean, some, sometimes uh, self-professed and enlightened companies will, will say that, but it's, it's not very common. But yeah, most employers, though, in hindsight, they say they love these things that are, are very qualitative skills in, in a lot of ways. But, you know, that's not what they look for, I found, in the job hunting process. And in particular, I was told that just the fact that I could teach and kind of rally troops in a way, I think it was that exact, you know, C plus to B point that you, that you highlighted as well. I think that's what caught their eye. And I had no idea until after the fact. So I, in a way, part of I got a little bit lucky in that one of my employers did read between the lines, at least to a degree. But since yeah. then, I've upgraded the resume. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And and I think it's important for everybody listening to know that your resume is not your only tool in the toolbox. It's not your only weapon in the fight. And so let's talk a little bit about some of these other assumptions we make that harm us. The first one we talked about a little bit is assuming that your credentials earn you a seat at the table, that I have this degree, therefore you must be interested in me. Is is that something you saw in a lot of people? You know what? I don't know if everyone else assumed that. I think a lot of grads like myself hoped it would be true, maybe half-heartedly. But I have to say, I was drinking the academic Kool-Aid hand over fist. So I don't know if my perception of that would would be an accurate estimate for everyone, but I don't think that grads really are given any other obvious tools, or at least they're not taught to use any tools. So that's that's just sort of their default setting. Yeah, it is certainly an achievement, and and it's certainly something to be proud of, to have completed that advanced Mm -hmm. course of study. But again, the, the person hiring you 
may not even consider that to be a benefit. I don't know if you had this experience, but I was told, well, we, we won't hire you because we think you'll get bored and leave. And that <laughs> was like, I really, there was this job I really wanted. And they told me there's no way because PhDs don't, don't stay. Like, well, now what? Yeah, I know. And like, you, you think that you're safe because you're like, well, you know, I can always take something less specialized, but I've got the options. And then some people say, well, actually, we don't want to invest in you. One of the mistakes you say is people rely exclusively on job portals. So I go on to Indeed or Monster or one of those, and I submit hundreds of resumes. I haven't done this in a little while. So what does it look like when you're searching for a job in these job portals? You know, I found that when I picked one or two good industries where I knew I wanted to actually apply and work in, I would say that I probably looked at about 20 applications a week, maybe, wow. maybe 15. And Not for nine months. I mean, <laughs> if we take 20 yeah. a week times nine months, but it's hundreds, yeah. hundreds and hundreds wow. of job applications. Yeah. And that wasn't working for you? No, it, it just wasn't. Ironically, most of <laughs> most jobs I've landed did come through uh, a job portal, but you know that was so far on the other end of all the the steps of this process that I talk about on my website that you know there was no way that was going to work for me alone as a fresh graduate. So, you know, one of the things that's really worthwhile is first just network with who you know. Right. I wrote that off at first because I thought, well, my network is just a bunch of other graduates like me right. who don't have a job and who don't have experience. So, but you know, there are tons of people who are not your classmates. There are, you know, older siblings who have maybe been working for a couple of years. You know, your parents, their coworkers, your friends' parents. You know, and when I started thinking about that, I realized, wow, you know, like two of my friend parents are entrepreneurs. Like, I bet they know tons of people. They did. And they knew you for years and liked you and were willing to help. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't mean or rude beforehand. So that, that did help when, when they liked me a bit. <laughs> you could always ruin that later. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that was probably the first thing. The second thing is you can actually use recruiters. Yeah, this is a, a world that I don't know enough about. And so tell us about who recruiters are and what they do. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I had to find this out the hard way, but it turns out recruiters find candidates and connect them to companies. This is probably no secret. But the biggest misconception is that they actually get paid by the company, not the candidate, which means they want to source the best candidate. That's true. There's stiff competition. But you don't lose anything by trying to use a recruiter. And you can go to multiple recruiters and say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is my mission. Here's my portfolio. Can we work together to try to find me a, a placement? And the company will pay them. Usually, and I've heard it's anywhere from 20 to 50% of the candidate's salary. So they are on your side in terms of A, getting you a job and B, getting you a good salary. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah. I mean, all yeah, all the incentives are there, right? How do you find so, a recruiter? Where where do they where do they hide out? Oh well, they don't hide, but they do live on LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you want to find recruiters, go to LinkedIn. And you know what? I've I've recently dabbled in the LinkedIn marketing game, and I have to tell you, they are vocal. They are around. You can fall. You don't even have to connect with them at first. You can just follow them to see if you like their brand, if you like their style or the way they do business. And some of them are hilarious and it's just worth following purely for the entertainment and the insight. Do they tend to focus on a specific industry? So if I'm a history student or, or grad, do I look for history recruiters? Or if I'm in the STEM field, do they tend to know certain industries better? I would say that they do. But the way to approach that could be different depending on if you were a STEM or a humanities grad. And the reason I say that is because uh, as a STEM grad, you know, you're very familiar with one field and that will probably have clear applications, direct applications to certain roles in industries. But on the other side, I would say recruiters would tend to specialize in an industry like, you know, 
maybe galleries, museums on one hand, or another one might be in marketing and advertising. Now, as a humanities grad, like as you are probably aware, you know, it, they don't translate directly in most cases to a job. You know, there's legal studies and some outliers, but but generally though, it's more the start of your professional education, not the midway point or even the first 25%, you know. So if you're a humanities grad, by contrast, I think you would want to think about where you're headed and then try to gear your resume, your LinkedIn profile and your portfolio website. Yes, you need a portfolio website all toward these one or two industries where you know you want to work at least for the foreseeable future. And then you can start going after recruiters. When they see that you're a match for their industry, that's when their eyes will open and that's when they'll start paying attention, in my experience. And and they will be putting effort into your job search at that point. Yep. If I find a job on one of the portals, the job portals. You say that it's a mistake to assume that you can't reach out to the hiring manager. So if I see that job portal and and maybe I see the hiring manager's name, I shouldn't call them, right? That would be bothering them in their job and they want to be unbiased <laughs> and not be influenced by me. Yeah, and I fell for that for so long. And to be fair, some companies are rather... I'm not sure what the word would be a little more protective. Maybe. Rigid. Yeah. And you know, with some companies that's considered a little bit rude, I guess, but I think if you're going to be reaching out to a number of them anyway, you'll probably make a better impression on the other 80 or 90%. And yeah, honestly, if you can do it before you even have to apply, if you can scope out a few companies where you think you might want to work, just, you know, hit them up for advice you do that often enough, and over a few months, you'll have a real valuable developing network where you can get pointers. That even if you don't know someone in that exact role or in that exact company, one of your contacts might know someone who worked there like six months ago or something and can maybe give you an intro or a tip or something. And how do you reach these people? Is their contact information easily available? Do you call them? Do you LinkedIn message them? That's, you know what, that can change from <laughs> from company to company, but my go-to sources would be A, yeah, LinkedIn. Everyone has a contact info box. They, they can decide to keep that private, but many people don't. Zoom info is also pretty great and free most cases. And the other, this is getting into sort of the, the dark art of digital marketing, but there is a tool that I highly recommend you try called Hunter.com. IO and it pulls email addresses if they've been publicly posted all above board. And so you can actually download this as a Chrome extension or just make a free account. And if it's a small enough company or even a large enough company, it can also say, Hey, well, you know, even if we didn't find this person's email address, we noticed that this is sort of the pattern of how pattern. they work. Yeah, I so, always wondered know. how people selling things get my work email address because I get thousands of inbound emails. Now I know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember if it's posted on the Hello PhD website, but actually, you know what? I've got this open right now. I can tell you. Oh, no. Yeah. Let's see here. Yep, yeah, podcast at hellophd.com and puzzle at hello. Oh, we used to have a puzzle com. segment. That was a yeah, few years so, ago. Yeah, and it shows you the exact sources where where and when it pulled that address. So if it's from like three years ago and you're like, I don't even know if this person works there anymore, you don't have to use it. But you might be able to find the email address of the person you want to reach. So I mean, really, what do you have to lose? At the very least, you've shown that you're dedicated and that you have initiatives. Even better, if you're going for a sales role, I mean, that's I mean, that's gold, right? Who wouldn't want to hire a go-getter? Yeah, I really appreciate this advice because you can feel a little bit helpless sending these mm -hmm. resumes out into the ether and then sitting on your hands. And being able to be proactive, whether it works out or not, at least feels like you did what you could, right? It's not... I tossed the coin and it came up how it came up. It's I put my effort into it and it didn't work out, but maybe I met somebody who met, introduced me to somebody, whatever it is. And, and you really do learn about the job that way. Yeah. And honestly, I think, I think new grads might be surprised at how 
effective they really can be at this. You know, seasoned salespeople are considered good if they land five to ten percent of their prospects, or if they get like a ten percent response rate. Think about that. Ten percent. You reach out to a hundred people or a hundred employers, and only ten percent get back to you. You feel awfully like, what am I doing wrong? Like. Like I was an A student, I was I was borderline celebrated, a king or queen of the campus, you know, wearing the crown. And, and do you know and who I no, am? No. That's how I start every email. <laughs> <laughs> Works like a charm every time. <laughs> but but you know, really, you know, even just getting like a five or ten percent response rate of oh hey, I don't know if we're hiring right now, but you know, thanks for reaching out. I appreciate that. That's actually a win. That's a long term win those people will probably remember you at least when they need to, if they're looking for candidates. That's right. Your next email will thread under the first one and they will recognize that they've had a contact from you. I I think that's great. The last bullet is really intriguing to me. And so I wanted to save this one. You say that it's a mistake to act subserviently or desperately with hiring managers. Tell me about that. Right. Oh, well, I, I probably could earn an honorary PhD in making this mistake. So the thing is, hiring managers, they can smell desperation a mile away. But if we're months in, we're feeling desperate, right? <laughs> this might be a yeah. real experience that we're having. Oh, yeah. And, and this was this was like another layer of Catch-22 when I was unemployed for, for so long, for nine months. And you progressively get more and more anxious and some of your actions can become more and more desperate. And then when you finally do some kind of opportunity, you're, you know, you might be like, you might get the nervous sweats in the interview, or you might, you know, I, I was coached wrongly and, and I adopted the advice wrongly that you should prepare for questions that you think you're going to be asked. Mm, yep. You know, and where do you I, see you yourself know, in re- five years would be an example question that everybody expects to be asked. Yeah. yeah. Really. When you try to prepare for questions that you think the manager or or you say things that you think the hiring manager wants to hear, you're really, you know, you're being a sycophant, right? Yes. And, you know, we, we just don't always know the difference. Uh, we can't always pick up on the subtlety of how to walk that line. My biggest flaw is that I just work too hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually recently uh, saw a portfolio website where the person said that, it was humorous, but they said that their greatest gift is their humility and their ability to speak about themselves in the third person. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But, you know, when it comes back to it, at the end of the day, acting subserviently or desperately really comes from a sense of not having worth or not being perceived as having worth. And there, you know, I'm sure there are psychiatrists and psychologists who are probably a lot more qualified to speak to that in depth than I am. But what I, will say at a, at a shallower level is that nobody respects a desperate candidate because they think your motivation is just to get a paycheck and to be safe. When really what you want them to think is that this person's motivations are that they want to learn more, that they want a team who can maybe even keep up with them <laughs> or yeah. They want to earn recognition. They want to make their mark. And, you know, none of those things are really tied to a particular industry or degree, right? Like that, that's applicable to any job seeker at any level with any kind of education or not. It, you know, it, it doesn't really matter what your background is. It's really more about character. When you create more confidence within yourself, you create a better power balance is maybe the phrase I would use. Yeah, I love that advice. My first thought was, well, you have to fake it. You have to fake the confident. But that I don't even think that's true. And, and I think I love how you put that. I think your excitement for the role, and, and hopefully you truly are excited by this job, mm-hmm. and you think you could solve this problem, or you could learn a lot doing it. You don't have to feel desperate about it if you are enthusiastic about the prospect. And yeah, let that totally. come through and, and let that energy show the, the hiring manager that hey, this person's going to work really hard because they actually care about this problem. 100%. And honestly, if you have a portfolio or even just one project or something under your belt that says, I've worked on something like this before or something sort of adjacent to that and I'm just really raring to go and I want to do more of that, that will add like at least one or two layers of icing 
to the application cake. You know, it's and and you can you can also generate more of that confidence yourself if you've done a project like that, even just a small limited one. You know, even just writing one article for one informal publication somewhere or even just on your own blog or a thought leadership piece on your own portfolio site or whatever it might be. But, Self-publishing <laughs> is so easy now. Yeah. There's no excuse. If you want to have that access, you have it. Yeah, absolutely. What didn't we talk about that we should have? The one thing is, I think, process. People need to focus on the process of the job search. And submitting applications really actually comes near the end of that. The first part, it, this is what I cover in my ebook, but you know, really it, it means to build yourself up as a quality candidate before you start promoting yourself. And this can be done actually pretty quickly. You know, like we've talked about quantifying your resume or, or adding some kind of measurement. Well, then, you know, you can also just copy paste a lot of that to LinkedIn. Start networking, yes, but do that by adding value. You know, create some of your own, pro your own projects, <clears throat> make a portfolio site and create your own digital presence so that when you do get around to talking to recruiters, when you do get around to networking, when you do get around to applying to jobs, you have credibility. You can say, I've done this and this and this. Even if it's entry level, that's okay. In fact, that's perfect. You can say, I'm working on these skills. Might not have mastered them yet. Totally okay. But, you know, I've taken a couple courses on Udemy or here or Coursera, whatever. And once people see that, they're more engaged. Once they see that you're committed to yourself, they will begin to commit to you. You know, you, it's not just a numbers game. I, I would say the equation is probably 75% quality, 25% quantity. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And I love that there are proactive steps. Again, mm -hmm. I am not the passive observer waiting to get picked up by the ship as it goes by. You know, I'm not <laughs> flailing in the ocean here. Yeah. Um, exactly. There's a lot yeah. I can be doing. And so, so tell us about your website and this book that you have to walk people through these steps. Where can they find you online? Yeah, well, you can find me at employedhistorian.com. And really, it's just a website that teaches new graduates and humanities and liberal arts grads how to build careers and how to land their first job in particular. I would say beyond I, I, liberal arts and humanities. I would say that you know, I've read through many of your blog posts now, and the advice is broad and, and it is timeless. I, I think these things that you've written applied to me when I went through the process and I went through the process quite a while ago. So, you know, <laughs> it's not limited just to humanities, <laughs> I don't think. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, you know, I've tried to get a bit more niche content out there, but I, yeah, I did start with the broad applicable stuff on, and, you know, you can read all of the, all of these topics for free, how to really optimize your LinkedIn profile, how to make you know the perfect one, so to speak, how personal branding works. And, you know, I've actually interviewed one or two personal branding specialists and, and coaches, so to speak, and, and gotten their advice, some job search strategies, resume tips. Uh, and I've always tried to insert my own resumes or LinkedIn profiles just as an example. Or if I see someone who's done it even better than myself, I'll, I'll just say, hey, look at this example. This is great. You could do this. I could do this. Anyone can do this. But it does take effort and strategy. And my site really is just about showing them how to channel all that energy, all that effort. Instead of into, you know, 100 days of nothing to show for it, you can set milestones for yourself that are very clearly set. And then you can really use that as a barometer to say, okay, I'm ready to apply to these jobs and I know who I want to be and I know how I'm going to position myself. And really all of, everything on the website really is in service of that goal. And you've got a book that structures all of this, right? So I'm, I don't have to necessarily right. click through blog articles and piece it together myself. Tell us a little bit about the book. Sure, yeah. So really, it, it is a condensed, very process-oriented version of what you, a lot of what you'll find on the website with more specific step-by-step -step stuff. And it starts with quantifying your resume, like we've talked about, with real-life examples, how to optimize your LinkedIn profile, how to reach out to recruiters, how to... And, the big one, I think, is how to make your own portfolio website. And really going all the way up to interviewing and 
you know, how to turn interviewing on its head a little bit. Instead of being a meek <laughs> job seeker who, quote unquote, is just grateful to be here, how do you actually walk in the door with confidence? All of these things feel like black boxes that are, <laughs> you know, you just can't understand. <laughs> but the reality yeah. is there are steps that, that everybody can take. There have been people down this road before them. Some have succeeded, some have failed. Yeah. And so I think you're trying to help take those successes and, and multiply them. Uh, the website is employedhistorian.com. And are you active on social media? I am. I have become active on LinkedIn uh, in particular. So if, if you'd like to hear jokes about <laughs> the job search struggle and some really practical tips, please follow along. Well, I will go find you there. And Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Daniel. It's been a pleasure. All right, Dan, that was a great interview with Andrew. Yeah, he and I obviously had a few laughs. We got along great. Um, you know, both of us, I think, are, are passionate about this transition for graduates to be able to find jobs that they love. And I think both of us went through a period where it felt really difficult to make that transition because of the skills that we had developed in, in school versus what we needed to be able to communicate to a hiring manager. Yeah, one thing that really stood out to me that he was describing that I think can be a really challenging part about the job search is these feelings that can increasingly bubble up as you're you know, you're searching for a job and you're trying to find the right fit and you're trying to you know, get your resume where it needs to be and you have that first interview and maybe it doesn't work out and then a month goes by and then two months go go by and you increasingly have this this anxiety and I imagine imposter feelings start coming in and you know that appearing desperate is the last thing that you want to do that could be a kiss of death so as true. he described. But yet the reality is you are feeling more and more anxious and more desperate. Um, but I thought he shared some really great, what I, what I liked about this day, I thought he shared some really great concrete tips that I think would be really useful for anyone who's listening who is just entering or right in the middle of the job search themselves. Yeah, I, you know, it was a long time ago for me, Josh, but that first job that I got out of grad school, and, and again, for people who don't know my full history, I took a physiology degree and ended up doing carbon accounting, so totally outside of my experience <laughs> and skills. But I knew I wanted to work in the sustainability, the environment space, and I remember interviewing for a bunch of different jobs in that space. There was one that stands out in my mind that was a kind of a transportation, sustainable transportation job. And I remember interviewing for it in my car, in the parking lot of my, uh, you know, like the condo I lived in. And wanting to make a good impression, I did this phone interview, but also realizing that I didn't, I wasn't really excited about the job. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, but I needed something. I needed to find work. And so I was trying to present this positive uh, persona that I was excited about this, but I, inside, that's not what I was feeling. And uh, I just remember that conflict, just like you're talking about, of needing it, being desperate for it, but not being able to get myself there emotionally to actually want to do this thing. And luckily, I didn't get that job. I got a different job that was much better for me. I think it can be so hard to allow yourself to be honest with yourself as your job search sort of lingers on, Dan. Like if you, if, if having the experience you did where maybe going in, you thought this job was going to be a really interesting thing to do, a really, really aligned with your, your values and your interests, you realize that it's not. I would be interested to know, Dan, if the situation would have been different and maybe you get offered a job that, you kind of know deep down this isn't a good fit for me, but I really need a job and I've been at this for a few months. Maybe I should just take this. Um, but then I always remember this piece of advice I heard at one time, which was if you say no to something, you're saying no to one thing. If you say yes to something, you're saying no to everything else. And so, you know, had you accepted a job like that, you're saying no to that next opportunity that did exactly. present itself that became a really great one for you. Uh, but I think that can be hard. <laughs> that takes that takes a an expectation and a hope for something better coming along. And that's hard to maintain 
if you are either you've already graduated, maybe you're living off of savings, you're living off of a spouse or partner's income, or you're about to graduate and you need to have somewhere to land because you don't have access to those things. I wasn't married at the time. It was me uh, taking care of myself. So, you know, everybody has to make that balance for themselves. But what I loved about talking with Andrew was he's got specific things that you can do so you don't feel like you are... Um, you don't have to feel lost. You don't have to feel like you are waiting for something to happen to you. There are things you can do today. One thing I wasn't 100% sure of going into listening to this interview for the first time was I knew Andrew, based on his website and his background, the employed historian, that he was going to be approaching um, approaching his job search and career advice from a humanities point of view. So I was really interested to see how many similarities and overlap there would be to some of the advice maybe we give or we hear from folks who are in science PhD programs, which we know is a lot of our audience. And I thought there was so much overlap in the things that he was talking about, ways that he coaches humanities grad students to really reframe the experiences they've had, the things they've learned, I mean, really transferable skills was exactly what he was talking about. How to reframe something that maybe seems very specific, very niche for your field, your program. You can really frame those skills in a different way that shows employers how valuable the things you know are to them. Yeah, I was really interested in understanding and maybe asking you, Josh, who has just transitioned jobs. If you think back to your prior position... Uh, I assume you maybe thought about advertising that position as as somebody to replace you, um, but you also thought about what made you successful in that role. Is there a difference between what you think made you successful and the things that you put on a job posting? Because it sounds like, the, for Andrew at least, and, and I'm sure for a lot of other people, the things that make you a great employee are not the things that they're necessarily asking for or looking for in your resume. Yeah, that's really tough for for folks who are doing hiring. And and this is I'm not going to say this is always true because I think what employers really hope to find always is this unicorn of a person who is has the exact overlapping the exact experiences that they're looking for for the type of job they're hiring for. They've already done but, this once. Yeah, but also the exact type of intangibles, the exact type of, whether it's personality or soft skills, sometimes people call them, just the right motivation for doing that sort of work. But where I've seen, I have a lot of experiences seeing many times where that has failed and wrong decisions, in retrospect, wrong decisions were made in who was chosen for a position. And in my experience, from my view, Many times, maybe nine times out of ten, that happens because someone was chosen because the exact experiences they had being a direct overlap to the job description was given such a high priority that other aspects of what makes a person successful in that type of role is overlooked, when really it's that part that might be more important for someone really thriving in that job versus, well, okay, we want someone who can write Python. This person can write Python, so we're going to hire them. Um, and I don't know, Dave. Actually, maybe that's a bad example. Maybe coding, you just want somebody who can write the code. But from the work that I've been involved in, I think you do. there are lots of considerations beyond just, have you done exactly this type of work in the past? I think that makes sense. And, and that would be a different episode for... If you're a hiring manager, here's how to <laughs> write, write, write a job. Yeah, didn't mean to go on a tangent of advice for hiring, but 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 I think Dan, but I think if there's advice there for people who are on the other side who are looking for jobs, I think what you can do is when you learn about a job that you're applying for, as you you know, there are different levels of learning about it as you as you read the job description, as you do a little research on your own as you start to meet people, even going through the interview process, really think about beyond just the experiences you've had, what about who you are, what motivates you, your values, your interests, do you think would make you good for that position? And really, I think a lot of that is exactly what what Andrew was talking about. Maybe you, know, you could say, well, 
I did a molecular biology experiment with a thousand samples and you're applying for a job that has nothing to do with that. But maybe it could be useful the fact that, you know what, I can organize and manage really large data sets. I can look at data and answer questions. I can do data visualization, make graphs. You know, that might be really relevant to the job you're applying for, even if it's exactly. not about molecular biology at all. Josh, while we were chatting here through the power of computers, I pulled up a resume of mine from August of 2007. So Those were the I, days. I was still in graduate <laughs> school at the time, I was a PhD candidate. And I'm looking at my, I've got qualifications at the top with these little bullet points. Uh, so my qualifications are broken down into categories. I got research and analysis, project management, something, something. Okay. So the first one says almost 10 years of interdisciplinary scientific training, focusing on data acquisition, analysis, and interpretation for a diverse audience. That's got a number in it. That sounds great. <laughs> ten, ten That's great, years. Dan. Uh, next, project management. Ex executed independent research project from proposal to publication. Skilled at multitasking. Consistently perform three or more independent experiments at a time. Prioritizing and overlapping them for efficiency. And by efficiency, I mean failing on three of them because <laughs> <laughs> two of them uh, interrupted the third one. I thought it meant you hated doing those experiments so much that you wanted to figure out a way to get them done as fast as possible. That is totally possible. Anyways, it's fun for me to look back at these things. Um, I, I clearly had read the advice that you need to have a number <laughs> in your <laughs> resume. And so there it is. But um, I think what I, what I really appreciated, appreciated about Andrew's advice was he brought a lot of these ideas up to date. So I didn't do this job search in a time of LinkedIn and um, recruiters and all of that stuff. So that was kind of new for me to hear about all of those ways of leveraging technology and leveraging these these recruiters to help do some of your work for you. It's not just you that has to do everything. Yeah, and I think that's why we bring people on the show like Andrew and I would really advise everyone, um, if this sounds interesting to you, if this, the things that Andrew is talking about are relevant to where you are right now in your career, check out his website, Employed Historian. He's got a blog. You mentioned an ebook. Um, based on what I heard in his, in his interview, Dan, he's got a lot of really great articles and really specific tips uh, for anyone who's on the job, the job market. All right, Josh. Well, great talking with you today. Uh, I love talking about jobs, as you know. And if our listeners have questions or topic ideas, we would love to hear them. You can email us, podcast at hellophd.com. You didn't need me to say that. You can go to hunter.io to find out all of our email addresses. <laughs> you can send us a tweet at hellophd. If you like the show, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We love the feedback, and it helps new listeners to find us. If you'd like to support us, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, and click the Become a Patron button, or visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We'd appreciate the West Coast, East Coast, New England, Old England IPA money. Thanks to the ongoing support from our patrons. Next week, listeners can look forward to the Midwestern IPA from Miami, Florida that exactly. we're going to be sampling. It's we are staying great. far away from Ohio for that one. <laughs> All right, Dan, a pleasure as always, and we'll talk to you next time. We'll see you next time.